live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to a special edition of Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we are doing a special show in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking Together. SALT is an ad advocacy organization that's been doing work in the Northern Virginia area since 1983. Joining me today on my left is Senator Chap Peterson, who is my senator, and Thank on my you. right is Delegate Kay Corey of District 67 and Delegate Kathy Tran of District 42. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being Thank here. You, Thank you, Catherine. So you. I want to point out that the, the governor's veto session is on April 3rd. This show is airing after April 3rd. So we have a part-time mm -hmm. legislature here in Virginia. It m meets either 45 days or it meets 60 days in alternating years. This year, I think it was 47 days, technically, that the legislature mm -hmm. met. So after the legislature meets, the governor reviews all of the bills. He decides what he is going to sign, what he is going to veto. And mm -hmm. then the, the legislature reconvenes and to look at his vetoes and to also look at suggestions he has made for amendments mm -hmm. to certain um, budgets. So one of the things I will start with is see you get your take from the Senate and from the House about one of those is eliminating the driver license suspension for non-payment of court fines and fees which disproportionately affects mm -hmm. the poorest Virginians. Right. Um, we have an economy that is relies on people getting to work by car, especially in the rural areas of Virginia. On the other hand, these fines and fees are also a revenue for the Commonwealth of Virginia. But this has been a, a, a problematic issue. I think that the, the, the bill was actually killed and Governor Northam is attempting to revive it. So, Senator Peterson, sure. thoughts on this? Yes, I'd like to uh, speak on it. This is a bill we passed out of the Senate for I believe at least the past two years and maybe even further back than that. Uh, I'll give a, a props to uh, Senator Bill Stanley from Rocky Mount, who actually was a lawyer in Fairfax County for years, now represents a Southwest Virginia district but has proposed this legislation, which basically would say the mechanism right now whereby we suspend somebody's driver's license because they have not paid court fees or costs, uh, that as you mentioned accurately, what it does is prevents people from having a job and then they really can't pay their court fees and costs. Mm -hmm. They drive on a suspended license, they get picked up, they can't post bail, they sit in jail, uh, then they get behind on their child support payments and they sit in jail longer and it becomes basically the cycle that feeds on itself. So within the Senate and within the Senate Courts Committee that I sit on, this has been a priority for us for the last couple of years and we've passed it out with a pretty robust margin. I think it got out maybe 30 to 10 or 32 to 8 and then it goes over to the House which is, is sort of an alternative reality to those of us in the Senate so they'll have to tell me what it's, happened it's to it. But, but, but I get the impression it didn't pass in the House. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I, I, I would like to say one thing about driving privileges in Virginia in general we are not very generous, and we don't look at it as workforce development, mm -hmm. which we should. Um, and then in a minute, I will let you talk about the particular um, issue that the governor is bringing up, okay? But I want to say that for many years now, I have been trying to get driver's privileges for refugees who are here legally and are not allowed to drive. So it's like what Senator Peterson said, they're forced to drive illegally without insurance, without driver's instruction, and sometimes it can be a couple of years before they get their permanent residency through the courts. And it's crazy that we just won't allow that. The bill never makes it out of the House to the more generous and understanding and intelligent Senate. <laughs> I don't know about that. So now you that have to vote for it next time. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I agree, you know, with what Senator Peterson was saying. I think this is a, a cycle that is being borne out on the backs of, you know, some of our most vulnerable workers and families um, in Virginia, and we need to figure out how to break that. And I hope that the governor is able to successfully, you know, make amendments to an existing bill around it or that we're able to pursue that in a future session. I think that we we have to make sure that kind of the revenue that we're generating um, in Virginia that is 
is important is that we're balancing that on whose back we're getting that revenue from. And I think if we are continually to, uh, you know, creating um, hardships for some of our more low income families to be able to break that cycle, like it's overall not good for Virginia, right? And we really need to be considering that. Yeah. Right, and, and I will say too, just to, to, for those who at home who don't know the inner workings of our legislature as well as we do, there is a system whereby the majority party decides who sits mm -hmm. on these committees. Mm -hmm. And even though the Republicans hold a majority of one seat in each chamber, the committees are disproportionately allocated mm -hmm. on a partisan basis, mm -hmm. which means that some, sometimes things will get out uh, onto a floor for a floor vote. And I think the Senate is good about being able to pass a lot of, of right. bills. But the committee system, the subcommittee system, yeah, right. this committee system in the House is a sticking point because a bill can come over, but it can be c killed in committee. Yeah. Right. Or subcommittee. And, and the speaker, the majority party, not only decides who the chair is of each committee, but who sits on that committee. Mm -hmm. And there's no, um, there's no rule in the House about the minimum number. There's a rule about the max. But, and so we end up with very small subcommittees that are usually, dom are always dominated by the majority party. Mm -hmm. And so you have five people maybe making a decision about some bill, a bill that will really have big repercussions in Virginia. It's extremely frustrating. So it would be nice to see the Democrats in majority. Well, and let me just say my first term in the Senate, we were in the majority. And, How'd you uh, like it? Well, we loved it. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't hold it. But uh, we had the same system. I mean, we put our people on committees. Now, I, I would like to think we were a little bit more generous in terms of re allocating Republican spots on committees. I, I don't recollect us actually taking people off committees, which mm -hmm. I will say at the time as a freshman, this is back in 2007, I felt like we should have uh, because I had come from the House and was used to a, a little bit more of an adversarial process. Uh, but we did use subcommittees, for example. Now, I will say that right now in the Senate, we don't have any subcommittees, right. which is good because every bill gets a recorded vote. And that is good. And that it's is important. important. Um, you know, if the Democrats get into control again, and uh, obviously being a Democrat and we're in a position to control committees, you know, there is something for me said to have subcommittees to examine certain subjects and to mm -hmm. sort of limit the amount of. Uh, 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 legislation that actually gets a vote vis-a-vis -vis having every single bill voted upon, but it depends on what your perspective is. And uh, clearly in the House, I mean, Democrats have been in the minority since 97, Yeah. so it's probably been a little bit tiresome. Uh, but I think well, one of the things oh, I found, I'm sorry, one of the things I found really surprising too is, you know, some of these bills I think that um, affect our daily lives in really profound ways. So, uh, for example, um, you know, there were bills up around uh, just gun safety, uh, common sense gun safety Th policy 30 bills. of them, I believe. Yeah, 30, 30. of them. And mm -hmm. the one bill that Delegate uh, Rip Sullivan had put forward around a red flag law. So just making sure that if you are a danger to yourself or a danger to others, if you are presenting uh, some of these, you know, factors that we're make you know we have a process in place to remove any guns that you own, right? As you're undergoing kind of that due process piece, um, and I remember that sitting in that uh, hearing room where the committee was two Democrats to I think four Republicans or five Republicans, um, but also in addition to to the uh, imbalance in the membership of the. Uh, representation of the subcommittee, there was this time limit. It's like you've had 10 minutes to present your bill. Okay, it's been 12 minutes. We, we're gonna we're gonna end. And it, to me, it was just that's wrong, right? Like yeah. we're talking about a very um, important piece of legislation. I think that deserves, yeah. and right. as as other legislation right. deserves, kind of a full hearing and a full and conversation. That's a really good point because when I first started in the House, we were such a minority. What 32, I think, Democrats that we actually had more leeway from the speaker in terms of presenting bills. So quite frequently, I would put in a bill knowing it was not going to pass, but I'd have the opportunity to talk about it, to bring attention to it, to try to gather support for future years. But this year and last year, very, very few bills that might be considered uh, about injustice or social policy are heard at all. I, I don't get to present. I don't get. I'm not allowed to talk. It doesn't get on the agenda. And that's a partisan, what, a partisan sledgehammer that I um, really object to.
And of course, you, uh, Senator Peterson, mm -hmm. have been both a delegate and now a senator. You got a you got a promotion to, to the Senate. Well, I don't know if I call it a promotion. <laughs> I'm it's sideways. A, it's a different. It's a different. It's animal. a different animal. It's a different animal. And so, you know, from your perspective, you know, uh, there are thousands of bills, literally thousands right. of bills, that get dropped prior to the session. Right. And then it is like um, it's like a foot race. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and yeah. and people are on different committees. Like you're right. on several committees, and mm -hmm. some of them meet at the same time. Right. Some of them meet at seven o'clock in the morning, and you find out about that the afternoon before. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people really examined, if this was a business, it wouldn't be functioning very well. Um, but but also the allocation to what bills go to what committees. Yeah. Very, very critical. Very critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the LGBT bills, of, of, you know, got put into the rules committee, where they stayed for a while. Right. Until they put them in another before they killed them all. Right. But talk a little bit about. Well, this is one of the reasons how the Senate's different. In, in the House, the Speaker runs yeah. the show. The Speaker's mm -hmm. the boss. Right. The Senate's different because oddly enough. We have a lieutenant governor who breaks ties and presides over the Senate, but they don't really have any input into either either caucus, quite frankly. And I'm not saying about this lieutenant governor or the one before or the one before that. I mean, basically, the two caucuses run themselves, and then we have a Senate clerk who she decides which bills get assigned to which committee. And she is not elected. She's not right, elected. Right. She's a nonpartisan figure, but she right. will make that decision. But I mean, I think that's an important and, distinction. And, and that is not. an important distinction. We have a little bit more, I would say, institutional control as mm -hmm. opposed to, I think, the House is viewed as a little bit more political, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and that's just, again, that's just kind of our, our nature. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not to say the two caucuses don't still clash with each other, but we've also, we can have a scenario, we could after this fall, where we could be 2020. Mm -hmm. And in the past, we've done power sharing in the Senate. We had 2020 at, at, in 2012, and I was actually, the Republicans controlled the lieutenant governor's position, so we didn't do power sharing. I actually think power sharing occasionally makes sense because you could give certain committee chairmanships to different caucuses. For example, I, right. I, I'm the ranking Democrat on agricultural natural resources. Mm -hmm. Well, my district is not dependent on agriculture. No. I, I hope I'm not shocking anybody. <laughs> and that might be a, a chairmanship that really ought to be held by somebody who has a more rural district. Right. It's not. There's no, no no skin off my bones if that mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. But you know, these are the types of you know, trade-offs you can make within the Senate. The House, it seems like it's a little bit harder to do that. Yes. Yes, it is. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about where bills come from and the fact that, that constituents really are a source. Now, there are associations. Mm -hmm. There are lobbyists who represent associations. They're mm -hmm. registered lobbyists and they're paid by organizations to influence the outcome of certain right. bills. Right. But there is, among regular, ordinary citizens, mm -hmm. organizations like SALT. And this is where SALT mm -hmm. has a legislative agenda about things that they would like to yeah. see passed around TANF, around SNAP, mm -hmm. around right. the EITC. Right. But if I could get each of you, we'll start with uh, Delegate Corey, to talk a little bit about some of the bills that your constituents have brought you that, that impact them in your district, whether okay. they were successful or not. Thank you for adding that caveat. <laughs> um, a number of constituents of mine, including ones who can't vote, who are still in high school, have brought to me um, over the past at least four years, issues about in-state tuition, be they for DACA students or for students who are born in the United States but their family is undocumented. And a number of students in that situation are turned down by our colleges and universities for the privilege of in-state tuition. And sometimes that can make a huge difference in whether anybody continues in higher ed. So that particular issue has been brought to me repeatedly, and I have put in bills attacking it from different points of view. Uh, this time, a bill about the in-state tuition for those born in the United States but their families aren't documented mm -hmm. actually made it through mm -hmm. the House. People decided it was about giving American citizens their rights. But then when it got to the Senate, it didn't make it. Uh, it fell into the bin of immigrant bills, which mm -hmm. is unfortunate. It became a partisan issue. Anyway, that and other education issues uh, come to me a lot. I guess it's because I was on the school board the school and they board still here. think I am. <laughs> um, so that is the one that sticks in my mind the most. How about you? Um, I had a couple of bills and budget amendments I put forward this year that uh, you know, were informed by conversations with constituents. 
Um, I had a constituent who is a parent of a child in our Fairfax County Public Schools um, in special education, and she's also a strong advocate for families across Virginia who are in special education. And so she asked me to, you know, if there are ways we can fix the uh, due process hearings and who has the burden of proof. And so at the very, you know, and Fairfax County has a, you know, the county has a very kind of collaborative process or a process that's intended to be collaborative, um, working with families to address um, the academic needs of children in special education. But if all throughout that process, if it doesn't work and you're in the due process kind of um, portion of it where it's a, like a, an administrative hearing and uh, who has the burden of proof in showing that the school has or has not met the child's um, right to a, f a f you know, a free public education, right, free and appropriate public education. And so um, I put forward a bill um, at her request about that and worked with her on the language. And then um, she also was able to bring forward lots of different families, uh, both in the 42nd District, in Fairfax County, and throughout Virginia to come and speak about the bill. Um, uh, you know, the bill didn't pass, but what we were able to have is the chairman recommended that the bill, uh, that this issue be addressed in a JLARC study around special education. And so that was really an important step for the families, um, excuse me, in terms of what is next. Yeah. And so um, I'm going to continue pursuing that with the, the chairman of the education sub, uh, committee to make sure that he is um, still, you know, agreeable to that because I think this is something that's an important issue for families in my community. And so I was really glad to hear from my constituent about this issue. And then also as when, after that, you know, other constituents who found out that we were working on this issue got really excited and reached mm -hmm. out as well. So mm -hmm. while we're on that subject, mm -hmm. I will ask you about the rollback of the cap on autism coverage. Mm -hmm. Now that has mm -hmm. been, so when the bill was originally passed, I think in 2010, it covered behavioral therapy from two to six before the yes. children went to school. Yes. Then the cap to age 10 mm -hmm. and then it's been years mm -hmm. as we've tried to roll mm -hmm. back right. this age cap yeah, of 10 right. because autism doesn't end at the age no, of 10. It yeah. And so yeah. I, I was surprised, I guess, after every year making a run at this, making a run at this, that this year it actually passed. Yeah, yeah I was really pleasantly I was, surprised. I was surprised too, yeah. delighted. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but surprised. I mean, I was really glad because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, autism, uh, the, you know, being diagnosed on the autism spectrum disorder, I think so many of us either are personally right. affected or right. know people who are personally affected. And I think. The prevalence of that, I think, has really raised the significance of the issue, and also just there's just been tremendous advocacy from families who are absolutely affected. growing and mm -hmm. growing, and I think yeah. more people in general understand that autism isn't something that you cure in preschool; that it, it is yeah. a condition that will stay with you, and you constantly need support and education, and the family does too. And I was very happy to yeah. see. I yeah. think this is an example. An unusual example of um, at least the House listening to the voters. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting how it was reported in the media as to mm -hmm. who was I, responsible mm -hmm. for oh, really? the passage mm -hmm. of that bill. Yeah. Because, I didn't. Um, well, mm -hmm. so you have to ask yourself if the people in charge with the majority were able to get yeah. this across the finish line, then who were the people who kept it from getting across the finish line for the last four years? I oh, the same should, people? I think <laughs> probably the same people. So I think we should all be good consumers of information and yes. think thoughtfully about how how the story is told in the media mm -hmm. about how Absolutely. these bills get passed. But I'm going to turn to Senator Peterson and ask about some of your favorite constituent-led. Okay. And I have to say about the autism, I, that's something that's uh, in my family. And so uh, I would just say every autistic child is a different trajectory. Right. And, uh, just sort of realizing that and wrapping your arms around it, uh, it's a life journey. And uh, we've gone through with my youngest daughter. So uh, it's great that the benefits are there. Uh, you know, the ABA, it, it, it works. Uh, now, as to what extent it works with your child and to what extent mm -hmm. you kind of hit the, hit the ceiling, you know, it's gonna be a child by child determination. But uh, it is great that we have those benefits in place yes. that we didn't even have at all 10 yes. years ago. Okay. Uh, constituent uh, request and, and by the way I get legislation I, I tend to think I put a sort of constituent request come in three baskets one is a legitimate constituent then I might hear from somebody who represents an industry or a, a PAC or, or some type of uh, political interest group and then the third is just a lot of stuff that as an attorney I come across and just you know my own ideas for lack of a better term mm -hmm. um, probably the best idea I had from what I'm gonna call a constituent was 
someone who's not even a constituent, but he was a good friend of mine in high school. In fact, we went to the Fairfax High School 1986 prom together. Uh, we both had dates, but we rented a limo together back in those <laughs> days. And he ended up becoming the uh, uh, psychology professor, and then he's head of the psychology department at Virginia Tech. And we had lost touch with each other for probably 20 years, and he contacted me, and he had a class basically on drug dependency. And as you probably know, in Western oh, Virginia, the right. opioid addiction sure. was very intense. And uh, in Blacksburg, they were studying it and, you know, sort of physiologically what the manifestations were and came to me about an idea from his class that there ought to be a discrepancy or, or an accommodation in the criminal law to recognize when people contact emergency providers that they themselves are not at legal risk. And so I brought legislation in 2015, which I called sort of uh, over exuberantly maybe the Good Samaritan Person. Law. I remember and, the Good Samaritan uh, Law. Yes, that yes. bill passed. Yes. And actually, that bill passed in 2015, and then we amended it this year. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, is if someone's in a situation where they're with someone who's in distress because of a drug overdose, uh, alcohol, what have you, that they can contact the police, they can contact 911, they can drive them to an emergency room, and they themselves will not be at any risk for uh, possession or any other use of an illegal narcotic. And there's been so many situations where young people, and believe it or not, I was young once, uh, are in a situation where they want to do the right thing, but they don't want to be in trouble, they don't sure. want their parents to know. And uh, this was a bill that, in my opinion, saves lives. And not in my opinion, I know it saves lives. I mean, in Fairfax County alone, we have 117 opioid deaths mm -hmm. in 2018. So it, it was a bill that we passed, we got it passed, and um, that was something that, uh, again, my friend brought to my attention. I was not smart enough to think of it, and uh, Betsy Carr carried the House version, but mm -hmm. we got that passed in 2015, and I'll call that a constituent request because we both went to Fairfax High School together. Well, and you know, and I, just on that subject, Beth Macy has written a book called Dope yep. Sick. I'm reading it right oh, yeah. now. I just yes. finished reading it, yes. and it's just and it's reading a, it, and yeah. it's a, and okay. it's and it's amazing because your bill, my favorite author, by the way, mine too, yeah. Factory Man, True Vine. I'm yep, a big she's fan. an awesome writer. So, <laughs> so one of the things she points out in the book, though, is case after case of kids being left. Yep. left in the bathroom yep. with needles in their arms, yep. their friends cleaned up, yeah. cleared out, yeah. and just left them there to die. Yeah. So I would it's, say it's, this, this particular bill is critically yeah. important. And I know, um, Kathy, my kids are a little bit older than yours, but I will say I've got kids that are teenagers. Yeah. There is no greater nightmare than, and, and I know Ginger Mumpower, for example, who's featured in the featured book. In the book. Yep. There's no greater nightmare than having a child that's within the throes of that situation. Yeah. There's just no, 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 nothing like it. And it just, it, you know, it's, it, it immobilizes you as a parent. What, what can I do? You know, who, who do I, who do I, where do I spend the money? Who do I hire? And these kids cannot get out from under it in some cases. Yeah. And as long as we're on that subject, what do you think about her? Um, well, you haven't finished the book yet, but she was talking about, first of all, Medicaid expansion. And okay. the fact that us, us having delayed Medicaid expansion meant that there were fewer resources to yep. combat this problem where other other states had taken it and had resources. And then secondly, right. she believes that primary care physicians need to be involved in identifying and being part I, of drug treatment. I, I also think there are too many drugs available in the USA legally. I'm talking legal mm -hmm. prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. we, we prescribe them too frequently. Uh, doctors have become over-reliant on them. Uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers have become too big. Uh, they've had too much of a say in, in basically how these have, are, are parceled out and we're paying the price for it. So we could do a whole show on that. Um, I know. But uh, yeah, no, I, I've read her book. I'm actually, I'm reading it right now. It's riveting and I'm a huge fan of hers. Yeah, and so that's, that's what it comes down to. I know Kay, you, uh, D Delegate Corey, <laughs> you have <laughs> worked right. with Friends of Guest House, as I have. Yeah. And a lot of the women who are incarcerated are incarcerated on addiction and drug charges. Yes. The incidence mm -hmm. of women being incarcerated has exploded, but yes. it's not violent crime. Right, it is you, not. A lot of it is is based on trauma and trauma mm -hmm. that leads to addiction. Mm -hmm. And then there's this cycle, which mm -hmm. Beth right. Macy points out in the book, of going into jail, which probably mm -hmm. saves some people's lives, but then getting back out and without any supports or yeah. rehabilitation or programs, they go right back to right. where they were. They, they're right back in their neighborhood and in their family. A number of the women that I've talked to who have been incarcerated on nonviolent charges are doing our uh, helping family members. They're trying to buy the drug that their their child, their older child, uh, is addicted to. 
so that that child won't get arrested. I mean, it's a wide web. Mm -hmm. It's not only the women as addicts. Um, as women as mules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I learned Absolutely. in the book. Women as mules who are actually going and getting the drugs for distribution, right. and they're getting busted. Yeah, it, yes, and it's been, um, what, what's the statistic? Sevenfold increase in the past two decades in the number of women incarcerated in the United States. Mm -hmm. Half of the women in the whole world who are incarcerated are in the United States. And we, our system is not set up physically or in any other way to handle that number. And I think one of the big results that you can see, because we're not set up to handle it, is how much recidivism there is mm -hmm. in, in that particular category. Can we talk a bit about Medicaid expansion? Because we, we talked earlier about how everything is incremental in Richmond. And that's true to a point, but there's also moments. Yes. There's moments when you can do something major. And there was such a moment in 2013 when we had the transportation bill. Yes. And by the way, I didn't like the bill and I didn't vote for it. <laughs> I but remember that. I told my caucus, Bob McDonald was the governor. He really wanted to get that transportation plan passed. I said, mm -hmm. do not agree to vote for this until he agrees to expand Medicaid. Because at the time, he had not come out against it. Remember, the ACA had just been ruled constitutional. So yes. we were still kind of in you know, no man's land as to, are we going to accept the Medicaid money? If right. we do, what conditions will we apply to it? And the Republicans had not really firmed up their opposition to it. In fact, when we first expanded Medicaid, mm -hmm. it went through the Senate 35 to 5, and that was with a Republican budget. Wow. So then there was starting to get pushback, and I said, you know, before you all agree to this transportation plan, mm -hmm. you ought to hold the governor's feet to the fire and get a firm commitment on expanding Medicaid. And we didn't do it, and you know what? That cost us basically five years of federal money that we could have pulled down. And, and people's lives and health Well, that, Yeah, that's lost. a no-brainer, of yes. course. Yeah. Yes. And there's, there's a lot of ramifications. Um, and before we go to a break, I want to just say that one of the, the ramifications, we, uh, we haven't talked about the fact that um, the Medicaid expansion that was passed had a uh, work provision, right. which is still sitting in the nebula of the federal government. Right. However, a, a judge recently yeah. ruled that in Arkansas and in Kentucky, it was not legal. So we haven't we haven't addressed Which is great. it yeah. is because we passed Medicaid expansion. We rolled it out January first. We could talk about federal judges for a while. Too. <laughs> but, but there's but there's like two hundred two hundred and seventy three thousand yeah. Virginians have enrolled. Right. Two hundred seventy three thousand Virginians have enrolled since January first. Mm -hmm in the Medicaid expansion. And so when we come back from this break, I do want to explore a little more what we can expect from Medicaid expansion and how it will be deployed for some of these other issues. Because everything has a budget amendment attached to it. The veto session is going to be all about the governor trying to amend the budget and get it passed. So for those of you at home, please join us after this break. We are talking with Senator Chap Peterson, Delegate Kay Corey, and Delegate Kathy Tran. And for those of you who not are familiar with the term the Freshman 15, our Delegate Kathy Tran is one of the Freshman 15 <laughs> that was elected in That's 2017. The 15 <laughs> so, join us after college. the break. So there you are, shuffling through a stack of resumes and you come to mind. This is it, first impression, my way in. But can my resume show you how I truly stand out? Like that I was studying, going to night school while working two jobs just to help my parents pay for groceries, or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent that is dedicated, hardworking, and determined like me. Operation Wonder Park is a go! There's nothing more powerful than imagination. Honey, have you seen my cell phone? But don't just imagine. My park came to life? Ooh, a plot twist. Use STEM to build. Ta -da! Create. She did it. And change the world. Who's with me? I'm more of a two feet on the ground kind of guy. It's gonna hurt tomorrow. If she can STEM, so can you. Find out more at She Can STEM. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun?
It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. This is a special edition of Inside Scoop done in collaboration with SALT, Social Action link Linking Together. Joining me this half hour this uh, is Delegate Kay Corey, Delegate Kathy Tran, and Senator Chad Peterson. So I want to talk a little bit about the life cycle of legislation. We talked about constituents who brought you legislation. Mm -hmm. But when should people start thinking about what problem they're trying to solve, how they think it should be solved, and then bringing it to you so that actual bill language can be created, the bill can be dropped, which is an in internal jargony term, mm -hmm. the bill can be dropped well before the legislature goes into session in January. Do you want to start, Delegate Corey? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, this has become more and more prominent problem uh, I see among my constituents as so many people become active lobbying for a number of issues just over the past several years, so many grassroots organizations, which is great. But then I have constituents asking me in January, could you put a bill in about so-and-so? And I can't, and they would basically have to wait six months, nine months before I could do that. Uh, and so I think it's very important for people to understand at least the basics of the calendar. And to that end, I was really fortunate I had the um, deputy clerk of the house come and do a workshop at Thomas Jefferson Library. Library. Yes. Yeah, and so many people came. Uh, and they, it was great. Anyway, a lot of people learned, and uh, it's on YouTube, so hopefully people look at that. But back to what you're saying. You don't need to know all the nuances, but you do need to know how the timing works and have an idea, perhaps, of how long it takes to get a bill drafted to the point where you want to support it. You, it doesn't automatically come out the first time mm -hmm. with what you had in mind. Is there a cap on the number of bills that you mm -hmm. can? The talk? second year of a biennium in the House, there is a cap of the number of bills we can file, and there's timelines certain number by this time, certain number by that time. The first year, you can have 30 million mm -hmm. <laughs> if you want, if you can get somebody to draft that many. You know. uh, but and, the first year is the even year, right? So yes, this, the first year of the biennium of, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, of, the, of the two year term, yeah. yes. And, and we are kind of unusual, I think, in that we have a biennium budget. Right. We have a one term governor, which is, we're the last ones, and I know you have an opinion about that, and it's different from mine. But anyway, we have a one-term governor, and so you basically, with the biennium budget, you have a governor coming in on somebody else's budget, right. Yeah. Right. and then they put a budget in place that yeah. the new governor ends up operating under. So I don't know if that's efficient, but that's the way it is. That's Virginians <laughs> don't really like to have governors or kings or emperors or anything like that, and I think that's where this came from, mm -hmm. really, from the colonial times of... Yeah. It wouldn't how, surprise how me. Long, how long, I think the first governor Patrick, anyway, one but, month. That's what the yeah, first the House of Burgess Henry said. Henry was the governor, and, yeah. and then, I mean, all those guys, Jefferson, Henry, Madison, right. they Madison. were all but governor. they were limited to, right. first it was one month, I right. think maybe then it was a year, anyway. Yeah, we yeah. are yeah. anti-monarchist yeah. society, <laughs> yes. and I know that frustrates some people, <laughs> including some ex-governors who believe that they should have been, <laughs> you know, re-elected by acclamation, but I love it. <laughs> But you know, having said that about certain governors who think they should be reelected by acclamation, you can actually serve two terms, just non consecutive. Non consecutive. Yes. Ah, so, right. exactly. so Mills Godwin is the right. only governor who's ever done that. First running as a Democrat and then right. running as a Republican. Exactly. Right. Correct. He was the first governor I ever met. I was ten. But but it has been done. So I wouldn't count certain former governors. Uh, no, out. I'm not at all actually, and I'm waiting for that. I'm uh, waiting for it too. To but but back to this cycle. So uh, delegate Tran. Yeah. So if people want to bring something to you, what would you recommend is the way to start that process? Well, I would say the earlier the better. Um, and I think the cap on bills uh, was is in the House. This I think was my understanding was There's the first year in the Senate that you had a cap in an odd year or no. If we did, it, it didn't get communicated to me. I don't know. Maybe we did or didn't. I forget. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so you know, it depends if you're talking to your delegate or your senator if there is a cap in the odd year, right? right. So this, like. 
2019 yeah, the rules being are an different. I think we have so a cap on serve. Well, everybody else can file as many as they want. <laughs> and that might be true. <laughs> but start early. Reach out and say, this is what your idea is. Right. If you know of the solution, kind of based on what Virginia is currently doing, you have a solution already. You might know that from your personal experience, your professional experience, or research that you've been doing in that subject matter about what other states are doing. Um, so like, for example, right. this year, I had um, Alexandria and Arlington notice that I did a renewable energy bill for county cities and towns in 2018. So they independently reached out to me um, to see if I'd work you know, on this issue again in 2019. And so we started working together in April, right after veto session. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you spend time drafting it, you yes. spend time kind of coalescing your thoughts and ideas, but also you're gonna use that time to reach out to other stakeholders to see if you can build a coalition and who right. that might be and who those partners might be to work with you to really fine tune the bill and try to identify other delegates or other senators right. that you wanna kind of have conversations with, right? So that could take a lot of time and, and I think the more earlier, time the better. Remember earlier you said that if you need to see where else it has either been tried and failed mm -hmm. or passed so yeah. you can use that information yeah. as well and that takes time to gather yeah. yeah so i would say you know soon after veto session start those conversations um, and if it's a year you know and, and i think every delegate and senator has um kind of different priorities for the community different interests that they have and so sure. if yeah. they think this might not be an area of expertise for them they might work with you to find somebody for, for whom this is really within their bailiwick right. too, right? So I'm oh. trying to think through that. I, I would like to add one caution, and um, I'm sure that this has probably happened to you, Chap, I don't know. Um, lots of times in the past several years, advocacy groups have come to me to get a certain bill, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, but they didn't tell me they were working with six other delegates who had already said they were gonna put the same bill in, yeah. which yeah. is really a problem um, just in terms of how much time you put in. It's not that six delegates are a problem if they all support the same bill, but if we're all working independently on the same bill, especially if it's a year when there's a limit on the number of bills, mm -hmm. that's not good. It's wasted resources, really. Yeah. Total waste the of resources, and it wastes the advocates' time, too. True. So pick one. Mm -hmm. Pick one. And so what is your advice? Well, what I typically tell people is until Labor Day comes around, I don't want to talk about the next legislative session. Mm -hmm. I'll talk <laughs> about the old one. I'll raise money. I'll go to, you know, parades. <laughs> but don't talk to me about legislation. You know, it's like, you know, it's off season for me. I'm trying to make money. After Labor Day, I'll start meeting with people. So September, October, mm -hmm. I'm meeting with people. Typically, I meet with people, you know, two, three days a week always right. at the same place, you know, always at the same time. And then by that time, I'm starting to get a feel for, okay, what's my agenda gonna look like? You know, mm -hmm. what are people interested in? What am I interested in? And then usually right about Thanksgiving, that uh, holiday, I usually take a few days off from work. And oftentimes the Friday after Thanksgiving, I'm either in, in, the, in my own office or, you know, if I'm away with my family, I'll take a day and just I usually type out a list of everything I want to file. Some things I will have already sent in a drafting request, but I try and have it finalized by that time, by yes. Thanksgiving. Good. So between Labor Day and Thanksgiving is when I got my head on it. Right. Now, after that, once you get it filed, as I'm sure the delegates can tell you, you got to go through fine tuning it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to share it with people. And I, by the way, I'm one of those people that I don't try and surprise anybody. If there's an interest group that's on the other side of it, I'll let them know I'm going to file it. And, and say, by the way, you mm -hmm. ought to know that I'm going to put this in. Mm -hmm. That way they can't say, oh, you know, Peterson didn't tell us. And I said, yeah, I did. I told you back Thanksgiving. So um, that, that's when I kind of start the actual run up to the General Assembly. It's probably from Thanksgiving up until, you know, the opening bell. But uh, like I said, before Labor Day, I don't want to talk about it. Okay. So what about bills that don't make it the first time around? Like, so the bill didn't make it. Right. Do you get feedback? Do people tell you, do you understand why the bill? Did you, do you redraft it? Do you uh, You know, sometimes it? I like it, and it's a matter of redrafting the members of the committee. Uh, you know, here's a perfect example. Is I've had the same bill for probably 10 years on basically the plastic bag tax, the five cent plastic bag tax with the money yes. to be de dedicated to the Chesapeake Bay uh, Water Quality Fund. And speaking of constituents, Jen Robinson's Girl Scout troop right. had that idea. Now, she claims they had the idea first. I claim I had the idea first. We're kind of <laughs> tussling it over middle. it. Okay, yeah. but anyways, we'll split it 50-50. But we've, I filed that, and uh, I've had it the same language year after year. I like the language. I've got it exactly where I want it. I just need to change the committee. And once the committee changes, it's going to sail through, and then yeah. the House is going to vote it. But sometimes, though, 
the feedback you get from constituents and especially other legislators allows you to change some of the language or the mm -hmm. emphasis in the bill and then it has a much better chance of succeeding. In general, I am a fan of don't do the same thing over and over. What is it? Bang your head against the yeah. wall and yeah. yeah. Expect a different I, result. I got yeah. a, I had a bill years ago that would not permit HOAs to ban solar panels. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> people are like, oh solar, you know, this is back when it was two to one Republicans. So we would get killed in the House, killed in the Senate. And finally I said, you know what? Conservatives love the word freedom. So I called it the Solar Freedom Act. It flew through. <laughs> oh, like, you oh got freedom, you know, like See? Mel Gibson and Braveheart. Freedom. Messaging, yeah. messaging. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what messaging. You were saying. Right. Right. So right. let's talk about the, what was called the Dignity Act. But there was okay. different iterations of that over a period of years. Yes. And what ended up this year was not how it started out. Right. But we count it kind of an incremental victory. Mm -hmm. Do yes. you want to kind of explain what happened with that bill? Um, essentially, the Dignity Act is a bill that. Re took sales tax off of men menstrual products as put them in the same category as a lot of other products like dandruff hair shampoo. tonic yeah, yeah <laughs> right um, where sales tax would not be levied and a number of people have put in a variety of bills like that mm -hmm. and it got to the point where last year mm -hmm. in committee say, yeah, yeah um, in Public safety, was it in? Anyway, it was in an odd subcommittee where uh, a lot of constituents from all around had come to, to listen to the arguments. And we got to the point where the Republican, uh, one of the senior Republicans, started saying, this is a good idea, but there are all these other it, you know, hygiene products that are so important that we should change the tax on them too. And then she kind of got stuck because everybody agreed with her and she turned that into a campaign uh, promise. And mm -hmm. so we have a bill that sailed through the House mm -hmm. and it included incontinence products right. as well as menstrual products. And so it didn't go to zero, it went to 1.5. Right. And again, yes, that's, that's the local portion, is that why? Yeah. And so, and so this is an example, though, of how it started like out as the one sausage. thing. sausage. <laughs> right. This is how it gets made. And so where, where that same person might have been the person who killed that bill the first three times, yes. now that legislator is saying, no, I'm going to take yeah. it and turn it into something else. Right. And, and, and present it in a different way, and it will right. get passed. Right. And so people have to understand that sometimes that's how it happens, too. Mm -hmm. Well, and I supported that. Absolutely. That, um, I mean, it's better to have 1.5% yeah. than 6%. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we were all delighted yeah. and it could be the beginning or not, but even if it's the only bill like this ever, it's still It's still progress. an improvement. It's still yes. an improvement. Yes. Totally. I think it's so important, like if we're not in the majority, it's, um, you know, one of the advice I've gotten in my first term is like, try to open the door to your issue. And then once you have your foot in, you can try to amend you know, legislation in the future to get, make the door open wider and wider and wider right. to the point where you need it to be. Yes. Because we're not in the majority, and so you have to figure out, I think, the rules of this game, right? right. And how to make legislation you want passed. Right, and one of the things I have been told mm -hmm. over and over is if, if the majority party tells you to take your name off it and then they'll take the bill, which is what has happened with some um, marijuana, medical marijuana bills, then do it, take your name off let it go because it's the end result that counts. That's true. So let's talk a little bit about, I want to talk about education and education funding because I was with the 4,000 teachers mm -hmm. outside the Capitol on that Monday that was Red for Ed Day. Good for you. And it was interesting how that all came down too because yeah. I'm standing there with 4,000 teachers who are marching and rallying and speakers and all of a sudden the Richmond Times Dispatch, I see an alert that says, the Speaker of the House says that they're going to support a 5% Teacher pay, teacher pay increase. And yes. I'm thinking, and again, how you tell the story and how it's messaged as to who did that. Now, mm -hmm. it seems to me that um, Governor Ralph Northam had already put that in his budget, as, if I recall correctly, that 5%. Well, he certainly had talked about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, it followed on what we had already had a, yeah, a pay had, increase yeah. in, the, in the biennium budget. Yeah. But we had, True. let's face it, we had more money than we had expected. The windfall. Yeah, I mean, well, and people made more money, and then of course, mm -hmm. you know, after the yeah, federal yes. tax cuts, we we walked into a lot of cash with, you know, we hadn't expected. Right. So it's the taxpayers should get the credit, although I'm sure we'll take it. 
Okay. Perfect storm, I guess, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So so that was one that was that teacher salaries got mm -hmm. funded, but there, 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 every year there's a lot of education bills. Mm -hmm. Virginia keeps kind of working away at trying to improve the mm -hmm. investment in our education, the outcome right. in yeah. our public school systems, mm -hmm. not just in Northern Virginia, but, and I know that um, Senator Bill Stanley has had a lot of bills right. last year and this mm -hmm. year trying to do something about investment. But we're still way under funding education. Mm -hmm. I th you correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be, but I think higher ed were funding like it was funded in 2009. Well, um, yeah, and I want to talk about yes, higher ed. Yes, I know let's you talk, do. Yeah. Let's talk about That's higher ed. That's what I... <laughs> right, well, I appreciate it. We, we spend about 2.5, maybe $2.4 billion a year on higher ed in Virginia, which is more than we did before and probably, you know, double what we did when I first came into the house, you know, 20 years ago. Now, if you track that by inflation, we've approximately kept up with inflation, but the, the no, I wouldn't say problem, the reality is, is we have so many more students in the system, yes. so we spend less per capita. Right. So while we actually give universities That's more meant, every year, right. they have more kids to educate, so our per capita financing of each child has gone down significantly. Right. That's why when people say, well, we're doing you know, less than we ever did before, and we're like, well, hold on, we increase spending every year, how right. can that be true? Well, they're both true. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, there's, a, there's sort of a lot of sort of remedies or, or not even remedies. We have a great higher education system in Virginia. Yeah. I mean, not good, but great. We have, you know, unmatched public universities all right. the way across the board. We've right. got a great community college system, you know, 23 different branch campuses. Yes. It's frankly underutilized. Uh, I wish we would put, you know. In the community colleges. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. wish we'd put more that. kids mm -hmm. into it. Um, how do we keep it affordable? How do we keep it accessible? You know, I've had legislation which is passed, which is requires universities to be accountable for their tuition increases, that they have to advertise it 30 days before they raise tuition, that they have to have yes. a public hearing, that they have to, just like any local government, explain what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, can we do more? Absolutely, we could do more. We could, right now we spend 2.5 billion, we could make it 3 billion. But now we are doing more about keeping tuition down or right. trying to, so and, and you should talk about And we took about 50 that. million, which we tied yeah. to. Yes. We told the universities, look, if you hold your tuition stable, you can walk into this additional money. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that there will always be a tension between, you know, is there enough money? Are we doing enough? I mean, I've been, yeah. I've been elected official for 22 years. I've never once had uh, a budget director come in and say, I've got enough money. Mm -hmm. there, that will never happen. So we'll always hear that there's not enough money. Um, to me, uh, you know, higher education is one of those where it's a little bit more elastic in that we have revenue opportunities from out-of-state students. We have revenue opportunities from commercializing some of our intellectual properties. Right. You know, we have revenue opportunities that are unique to the university. I mean, mm -hmm. UVA qualified for the Final Four. That's a unique revenue opportunity yes, right it is. there. Yes, it is. I mean, to be blunt. Sure, sure. You know, mm -hmm. our public schools, our K through 12 doesn't have that. Right. They're much more dependent on what we do for them. Exactly. So I always treat them as a little bit more necessary. You know, it's like that child where I got to do, I love all my kids, but one child I got to do a bit more, you yes. know? And uh, so higher ed, yes, we give them, we don't give them enough money, but you know, when you look at everything else, we have Medicaid waivers and K-12 and you know, public health and, mm -hmm. Sometimes they're going to get the short end of the stick by comparison. So let me ask about the, this. This uh, this is a SALT priority, actually, and that's a scholarship pilot project. Mm -hmm. um, TANF, which is Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. Uh, this is an effort to pilot a four-year test program mm -hmm. to try to break the cycle of poverty. Um, does that have a chance? Does, does anybody, well, does that have a chance? Haven't we been talking about that for a few years? I yeah, believe I there was so. at least a bill about it last year. Um, I heard a lot more positive talk in the General Assembly about it this year. I don't know where it's going, if it's going anywhere. Is that in our budget this year? It is in the governor's budget, I think. Okay, did, well, mm. governor's no. budget no longer around. Is it oh. in our budget that we passed? I don't think so. Don't okay. Think. So this is one of these things that we want to do. Yeah. If we've got TANF funds. Yeah. And so I think. Well, like, but it's a. Yeah. Oh, I was Go just ahead. going to say um, it's dependent. Thank you for reminding me on if there are surplus TANF funds. Right. And seriously, right. every year there are surplus TANF funds. We sit on a savings account of right. a lot of TANF money. And it's federal TANF right. money, right? So I think that's yeah. also the important 
piece for us to remember that these are not state dollars, these are not you know, st uh, state tax revenue that we're trying to um, be responsible about. These are federal dollars that we want to be responsible about, and these, this is a federal grant mm -hmm. right. to Virginia based on our mm -hmm. need, and so we need to figure out if there are creative ways that we could use it to help people who are right. currently on TANF right. be successful off of TANF. And I think that's what the scholarship program would do. I know that Delegate Kathleen Murphy had carried the bill for a yes. couple of years. Right. Um, last year, Senator Favola and I both put in budget amendments that would have used excess TANF dollars to try to do some creative pilots as well. But I think it's looking at how can we be more generous in terms of our TANF dollars with these very vulnerable families and children in terms of making sure they have the resources they need. And then with the excess federal grant, is or what are ways right. that we could use that grant money um, to help folks you know, move off of TANF it, as well. It's investing in helping people not need TANF. Yeah. I think we need to tell what TANF is. Oh yeah, oh, temporary, temporary okay. assistance for Temporary needy. assistance for needy <laughs> families. Federal money. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and it is. Felt, I remember being a city Sorry. councilman and 22 years ago sitting yeah. in a regional meeting and turning to my neighbor and say, "What is TANF?" Right. So it's I mean, just started mm -hmm. it's temporary jargon. assistance for needy families what we call welfare, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. some True. generations yeah. ago. Right, and so, and, and and this is all about making a living wage or or educating people. Mm -hmm. And we've got 23 community colleges, and we're we uh, in the main Virginia is focused on re educating people who are in industries that like coal mining right. mm -hmm. that you can't right. make a living doing that right. and mm -hmm. so so we've got these community colleges there is some focus on that and it's all about giving people the skills necessary to have a job with a mm -hmm. living wage but let's talk just for a minute because we've got like six minutes left yes. about a living wage and minimum wage sure. and Very what is going on with minimum wage because in Maryland the legislature just overturned the governor's veto and they yeah. will be implementing a $15 minimum wage slowly through 2025, 2026. Right. What does that mean for Virginia? I'm gonna let uh, the delegates <laughs> talk about it first and I wanna give, I'm gonna let them make, because I've had a couple observations, but I see it from a small business perspective as well as obviously from a democratic well, perspective. A social, a social justice issue. Yeah. I think that the small business perspective is what we have to take into account. I have not heard very many people on either side of the aisle disagree that we need to raise the minimum wage and to talk about the concept of a living wage, but it breaks down when you talk about how it affects small businesses. So Senator Peterson, I would really like to hear you talk about that. Okay, well let me sort of, we passed sorry, a bill and we had a vote on the floor and the Republicans sometimes let us vote on bills knowing that they're not going to pass but they want to quote get us up on the board and there was a bill to phase a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage in all, literally almost immediately and I put in a substitute that would have slowed the phase in down to I think it was 2025 or 2026 so akin to what they did in Maryland and then would have it, it slowed out the out years for businesses under I believe it was 25 employees or fewer which is how California has it and, I, and I, I own a small business. My wife and I have a, a law firm. We have four associates and probably six staff people. And so I'm very familiar with the whole idea of you can hire somebody full time, you put them on benefits, or you can hire somebody for 25 hours a week at you know, 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour. And that's how every small business in America operates. Sure. And you make that distinction, do I want to invest in this employee and put them on a 40 hour work week and you know, pay all the federal taxes and the you know, workman's comp and, and everything else? Or is it better to have them come in a certain number of hours and, and essentially treat them as, you know, in many cases it's a high school student, an intern? Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in is if I have an adult working for me, I want to pay them a real wage and I want to put them on benefits and things of that nature. I'll also say though that my business grosses pretty well. I have a lot of clients that, you know, they're not going to pay somebody 15 bucks an hour or if they are, it's going to be under the table. Okay, right. or if they have to be in a position where they have to pay them 15 bucks an hour, they're going to drop them back to 25 hours a week and take them out of full time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just how a lot of businesses operate, and that's yeah. in Northern Virginia, which is the wealthiest part of the state by a lot. Yes. So I told my colleagues, I said, look, you need to make sure that when you do something, you're actually helping working people. And if you put a law in place that has a, an impossible threshold for small businesses to meet, they're either going to close or they're going to avoid the law or they're just going to lay off people or just hire two yes. part-timers where they have one full-timer. And that was my biggest concern. And uh, again, you know, there's no perfect 
law. Um, I support raising the minimum wage. 7.25 an hour is way too way too light. Um, people need to be able to be compensated for their labor, and if they're not worth seven bucks an hour, they probably ought to be back in school. Sure. Um, but uh, that was just something that I, I told my colleagues. You need to slow down and actually listen to the business community, or at least the small business community, before you treat everyone like they're Amazon, because they're not. And speaking of Amazon, Amazon's HQ2 is coming into yeah. Northern Virginia, and they already declared that the minimum wage for their workers is $15 an hour. Now, most people are expecting right. the jobs they're going to create in National Landing, what a right. terrible name, National Landing are going to be very high paying jobs, but there's always jobs at the lowest yeah, level, sure. and they have committed to $15 an hour, and we already have. I think, uh, Delegate Tran, you pointed out, they're already in Virginia. Right. They're already, they have sites throughout the Commonwealth, and I think, you know, I am the daughter of a, small, a retired small business owner, and uh, twice over, but also when we first came to the U.S., my dad's first job was minimum wage in 1981, which is um, three dollars and like three ten or three thirty five right he had a raise you know we had to support my mom who was also working and me and then a new baby on the way so I come from that in terms of my roots and I think that inevitably we have to raise the minimum wage I'd love to also see giving localities an opportunity to implement a living wage too um, but I think the conversation around what is a good job and what are the other like it systematic things we need to tackle is really important, right? A good job is good wages, good benefits, a career path forward. We also have to have affordable housing, transportation so that people can get to mm -hmm. work, you know, a strong mm -hmm. education system. So I think that we can't look to raising the minimum wage as just in its own self, you know, the, the secret sauce that's gonna solve a lot of these issues that our working families are facing, but also step back and look at the bigger picture. And I think that's gonna be really important. I think it is too, and do we think that there will be another minimum wage bill next year? Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure there will be. I'm sure there I will be one. several. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But it, sometimes yeah. it's not just the bill, it has to be the climate. You know, yes. a lot of times you do a bill, you do a bill, you do a bill, but suddenly like, the climate yeah. changes. Maybe that's right. what it was with the autism insurance reform too, is yeah. after years of trying to get that yeah. cap removed, uh, this was the year. I, I think it, the climate has changed and people recognize that the minimum wage needs to be raised. I think, I agree. again, people also recognize that when you have a high threshold for minimum wage or mandated benefits, that it can be a disincentive to hire people. Mm -hmm. And so that, that you need to balance that. Absolutely, and we need to have a, a, a fully employed communities. And, and, and we need right. people to mm -hmm. have the skills for the employers who have moved here. Yes. And that's where we talk about workforce readiness. I know mm -hmm. that you had a bill too about getting high school students yep. More, more workforce I'm, ready. I don't have time to talk about it. You don't it. have time to talk about it. We'll you bring do a up show with 30 seconds it. left. I know. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll do a show together, You ran Jeff. out the clock on me, And Catherine. talk about it because I do think workforce readiness yeah. at every yes. level, yes. starting Absolutely. in elementary school, high school, the community colleges, mm -hmm. and our higher right. education system and retraining people is important. And I just want to say thank you so much, That's great. Senator Peterson, stuff. Delegate yeah. Tran, and Delegate Corey. Thank you. This has been a special edition of Inside Scoop in collaboration with SALT, Social Action Linking together. See how you can get involved in the legislative process.